Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for coming, uh, and I hope that you're enjoying DrupalCon. Uh, today's session uh, that I'm presenting is about JavaScript and accessibility. Uh, the thesis that I'm presenting is that we shouldn't blame JavaScript as a language for problems with accessibility. And although I think that more and more as developers and as a community, we are learning this uh, in principle, I think that there are still a great number of developers, whether I see it in forums or through Twitter or through uh, conversations with some of our customers, some of their teams, uh, where this is really something that people don't, don't quite yet have internalized, that they do think that JavaScript itself is an impediment to accessibility. Uh, if, if you weren't coming for JavaScript and accessibility, this is a good opportunity to leave. <laughs> Uh, so who am I? My name is Everett Zufelt. I've been part of the Drupal community for, I want to say, just about nine years now. Uh, spent a great deal of time contributing to the accessibility improvements in Drupal 7 core. Uh, somewhat less time contributing to Drupal 8, although nearer to the beginning of the Drupal 8 uh, life cycle, I was contributing more actively. Uh, formerly, I have been an invited expert to the W3C, where I uh, participated in the accessibility task force uh, that at that point in time was reviewing HTML5 as a specification to ensure that uh, it had everything needed to be, uh, to support the goals of, of accessibility. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, ooh, there we go, just getting to my list. Uh, oh. Also, for anybody who, who doesn't know, I'm completely blind. I've got uh, an, one earbud in here so I can read my notes. Going to try not to let that distract me too much. My colleague Yoshi here is driving the slides for me up on the screen, so uh, just to give you that context. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, number one, imagine if, maybe just talk through really quickly a couple of scenarios around you know, what are some of the barriers that persons with disabilities uh, do face when they're interacting on the web. We're gonna cover quickly a few myths about accessibility. Uh, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that we can address that will help people to understand some, some misbeliefs that people may have. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of truths about accessibility, some facts that just maybe help to uh, support the reason why we might be looking at this in the first place. Then we're going to move into, this is the front end track, so we're really not going to talk about uh, code. I'm not going to do coding examples uh, in this session. We're going to really talk more from the conceptual and the design and, and the user experience point of view around this problem. Uh, and so we're going to start by doing a little bit of a refresher on affordances. If there are any designers in the room, this is probably table stakes for you. Uh, maybe for some of the developers and others in the room, this is, this is information you'll be learning for the first time. And then we're going to uh, jump into JavaScript's role on the web. Maybe that's new to some people here. I would imagine most people here understand fundamentally the use of JavaScript on the web. We're going to talk about uh, HTML, we're going to talk about the document object model, and we're going to talk about the accessibility API and how those all relate to one another. Uh, we're going to talk about divs and meaning and, and why really the major challenge that we have when we're programming interactive uh, user interfaces for the web is adding meaning. Uh, we'll talk about transitions and single page, pa page apps. I think this week I've heard the words headless decoupled and API first. Uh, more in a three-day period of time than I've ever heard them used in my life, which I think is really good for our community, but it does pose some challenges around accessibility as we start to push user experience more and more to the client side. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about complex UI components. I'll give you some examples of where I think some organizations have done good jobs at this and where I've seen some others do jobs where there's some improvement. Uh, and then we'll wrap up by talking about what we can do next together as a community in order to progress around the area of JavaScript accessibility. Uh, so imagine if, I've got a few scenarios up there on the screen, uh, but imagine if you're, you're out there, somebody, one of your friends or colleagues has said, oh, you should really try this hot new thing, it's called Twitter, uh, let's, you should go get signed up, and you go to the site, you get excited, you want to get net, start networking with people, uh, and you find out that just however you try, there's no way for you to be able to sign up for the service. 
Uh, imagine if, maybe in a different scenario, you're, you're trying to find something, a book online, or maybe a HDMI adapter for your MacBook. Uh, you spend time browsing, you find the best price, you find the store you want to buy it from online, you add it to your cart, and you, you know, you've invested some time and energy here, and you find that there's just, no matter what you do, it's impossible for you to check out of that store. Uh, imagine if you log into an app for your job, maybe that's an, an HR-related app, maybe it's a travel booking-related app, this is, uh, maybe it's a project scheduling and planning app, it's something that's really essential to your job function in the organization, and, and all you see is button, 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 and you, you just can't figure out how to interact with them, what any of them do, or, or how to really use the app at all. Uh, imagine if you tried to book a hotel room, this is, by the way, one of the examples later on, and it's impossible for you to select a date. So if you want to check in tomorrow, which is the default date, that's fine. But if you want to check in any day in the future, it's impossible for you to change the date in the date selector. Uh, these are the types of experiences that persons with disabilities often run into when they're interacting on the web. So uh, they're frustrating, they're disempowering, they're not inclusive. We've used that word. I, I think there's been a number of times in the last couple of days I've heard the words diversity and inclusion used. Uh, these are the types of experience that uh, work against diversity and work against inclusion in our community and in the communities uh, for which we're using Drupal to build, to build digital experiences. What are some of the myths then uh, that we can maybe, low hanging fruit that we can quickly uh, dispel. People with disabilities don't use my web application. Uh, one uh, interesting example of this, years ago somebody said that they built a small gallery site to sell local artists' paintings and sculptures online and uh, I had suggested, and I took a peek at it, and I'm like, oh well, if you're a blind screen reader user, you couldn't possibly use that and they said, yeah, but why would blind people ever buy artwork? I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting, but probably a good, good rule of thumb to assume that anybody in the world, if we're really trying to support inclusion and diversity, anybody in the world with any set of you know, ability or disability likely going to want to interact with the web application you're building. Another myth, screen reader users disable JavaScript. That, I think that's the one that's been kicking around for a long time. The reality is, uh, you know, in, in the most recent very non-scientific survey, uh, no, screen reader users are no more likely to have JavaScript disabled than anybody else on the web. Accessibility will interfere with user experience and designers don't like it. This is a very common one that I've heard. Uh, I'm gonna go out on the ledge here and say that accessibility in principle does not interfere with great design. Uh, accessibility could interfere with bad design, but I think we shouldn't really care about that. Accessibility does not interfere with great design. If great design is about understanding the user's goals uh, and creating a, a, a wonderful way for them to achieve their goals with ease and delight, accessibility by nature, by its, by its, very, by its very definition, cannot possibly interfere with great design. Our web ac application is accessible, subtext, but we've actually never tested that, so, you know, we're just saying it. I had an experience this morning with a, an airline that, if you looked at my Twitter feed, you could tell which one, but I won't say out loud, where it's completely inaccessible for me to check in for my flight. Um, they probably believe that that's not a problem. I, they probably had the development team who did their very best to implement an accessible interface. I tested it in two browser, three browsers and two operating systems and I could not check in for my flight. I had to get a colleague to check me in. Nobody in my industry has been taken to court. That, uh, you know, I'm not really as familiar with the European legal landscape, but certainly in North America, it's becoming more and more rare that you'd be able to say that from from retail apparel to grocery store chains to big box stores to small mom and pop shops, uh, the, the uh, litigious uh, landscape is expanding, at least in North America, where it's, it's harder to identify an industry where there have not been uh, legal cases uh, put forward and in many cases uh, either settled or won by persons with disabilities.
So why did this happen? Why did we have so many of these, uh, these myths and, and untruths that floated around about accessibility? Uh, because we've been working on this for years. Uh, I think we've got a quote up here. It's one of the success criteria from WCAG, but it's from WCAG 1.0. Anybody that's been familiar with accessibility in the last decade or so knows that we're working on 2.0 now and, and have been for quite some time. Uh, ensure that pages are useful when scripts, applets, or other programmatic objects are turned off. So, I mean, right there, the web standards community, we kind of did it to ourselves, though I think at the time it was necessary because of the, the state and the evolution of browsers and assistive technology. Way back in 1998, uh, it wasn't possible for persons with certain types of assistive technology to meaningfully interact with a web application when JavaScript was running. running. And so in order to ensure that the web was accessible to all, there was a rule that said you had to make sure your application was accessible even if scripts weren't running in the browser. There's a lot of good reasons, uh, depending on your application and your contingency or your constituency that's using your application to maybe look at supporting uh, your application functioning without JavaScript running. Uh, assistive technology, in my opinion, is not one of those. So although this was a really good rule in 1998, uh, in 2017, I don't really think there's a lot of merit to tell the web application development community uh, that you're not allowed to build applications that rely on JavaScript. So what are some things that we do know for sure about accessibility? Number one, it's a human right. Many countries have ratified the, the UN's Charter on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, so right there, we've, we've got it as a right. About 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability. Uh, not all of those would impact your ability to interact on the web. And to be honest, most, most disproportionately skewed toward developing nations. Uh, still, I think it's a significant number, and even in, in parts of the world, whether it's Europe or North America or others, where, where we're maybe making an assumption, true or false, that the majority of our web traffic and users are coming from, there's still a great, a great proportion of people who are living with disabilities. Accessibility, I'm going to try to drive this one home, does not interfere with good design. Accessibility is essential for good design. And, and if you're a designer here and you think that I'm wrong about that, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you about that afterward. Making a web ex application accessible is easy to start. Uh, it, it doesn't mean you're going to do it perfectly. It doesn't mean that you're going to remove all of the barriers, but it's really easy to start doing. I think there was a great keynote this morning where uh, you know, part of what I saw as the takeaway from that was you, you have to start somewhere and you can't let your fear uh, or your lack of understanding impede you from taking the first step. The reality is, based on a highly scientific Twitter poll conducted by Spashing Magazine, that less than 75% of developers know more than the basics about JavaScript or web application accessibility. So if you're sitting here today and you're thinking to yourself, I probably have a basic understanding, then you're in the minority. You, you're already at the top of the list because more than 75% more than of developers basically say, yeah, I don't really get where to start at all. So I want to pause here and, and, and really talk about why I want to bring the design angle into this. Uh, web, app, web applications are designed holistically. Uh, we don't build them if we don't know what we're trying to build. Uh, and we don't really understand what we're trying to build until we understand who the users are. Uh, talking about accessibility from any angle really means that we understand that there's human beings. Uh, those human beings are interacting, in many cases, with uh, the applications we build through uh, modalities or experiences that are not what the majority, they, either they, maybe they can't see the screen, maybe they can't use a pointing device, uh, but they're interacting with the application in a way that is outside of the norm. Uh, we need to understand from a design perspective, design is everything in, whew, 
that's hot. Design is everything inside of the browser. If we don't have design, if we haven't created an interaction model, and if we haven't created a visual interface design, we really don't have any work that we can do as front end developers. Uh, and so I think that is really important for us to understand together what it means uh, from, an, from a design patterns perspective to create a great experience uh, because that's where we're going to find where the gaps are for people that are using modalities that are, that are uncommon or outside of the norm. So what are affordances? Uh, there's a quote up there from, from Smashing Magazine. I stole something else from them, but the reality is in life, uh, outside of the web, outside of user interface, uh, chairs have weight, they have dimensions, they have size, they have mass. Uh, but on the screen, it's really hard to infer what types of items I can interact with. What's a button? What's sitting on top of something else? Uh, what items are grouped together and which items are apart? Uh, what items can I interact with right now that I might not be interact able to interact with later? Uh, and in the physical world, we've, oh, just over time, objects have these properties that we've come to understand through, you know, tens of thousands or millions of years of building heuristics, how to interact with them. But the web and, and digital interfaces have been along, around for so much less time that, you know, there's a whole science around understanding how to make those items uh, convey what they are and how to interact with them. And the most common way to do this, because the most common modality for interacting with a digital interface uh, is visual, then a lot of the affordances, or you know, almost all of the affordances that are commonly used have to do with uh, modifying or, or adding visual attributes to elements that we have on the screen. What are some of the important ones? There's lots of category of affordance, but I've pulled out uh, a couple that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, there's an explicit affordance, so that might just be a link that says click here. That's pretty straightforward. Even if it doesn't look like what I think a link might look like, uh, if it says click here, I'm pretty likely to try clicking there to see what happens. A pattern, uh, so an example here is if we have a word or phrase with a downward arrow, we've come to understand that if that, that means that I can click on that and it's going to expand and probably I can click on it again, it's going to collapse. Hidden, hidden affordances, these ones get into a tricky area for, for users of some assistive technology. These are items where not until I've interacted with it does it do something. Negative affordances, this is another really common category. This is where we, we maybe disable the submit button on the form and that makes it look a little bit gray uh, and we know that we can't click it. We just, we've learned over the last several decades of interacting with digital interfaces that when that button looks like it's all grayed out, we even have a term for it, when that button's grayed out, I know that I need to do something else before it's going to activate and I'm going to be able to interact with it. Uh, but imagine for some of these items, you know, maybe this last one in particular, how do you tell the buttons grayed out if you can't see the button? So what's JavaScript's role on the web? Uh, JavaScript lets you interact in the browser, create experiences that are not just static. It allows you to modify and manipulate uh, what's in the DOM. And for those who don't have a lot of experience with DOM, that's a new word. Maybe you're, maybe you're a little bit newer to JavaScript and front-end development. We'll talk about that in, the, in a minute. But JavaScript lets you build dynamic experiences in the browser that don't rely solely on a round trip to re reload another page of content. So there's these, these three items, and they, they relate to each other. There's HTML. And I, I would imagine that all of us know what that is. There's the document object model, and maybe, maybe there's some people here who haven't had to work with that yet, or maybe to a lesser extent. And then there's the accessibility API, and I would, I would venture that probably the majority of people here today maybe have heard tell of it, but, but probably don't have a lot of understanding or experience of what it does and, and how it impacts people. HTML, that's straightforward. I'm not going to read a definition. HTML is... That's the markup you write. That's what goes into your TPL files or your Twig files uh, when you're working with Drupal. HTML is the, the code that gets rendered on the server and pushed out to the browser. Uh, 
the document object model. That's what happens in browsers, Chrome or Firefox, any, any browser really takes the HTML and one of the first things it does after the document's been loaded is parse out the HTML using a parser and represent all of the objects that you've created, all those elements with all of the little angly brackets represents those elements in a big tree with interconnected nodes. And it's JavaScript that's then able to interact with those nodes, manipulate them, add them, remove them, clone them, uh, change the attributes of them. What's the accessibility API then? Uh, and this is something that people are probably less familiar with. Uh, built on top of or as an extension to the document object model, each operating system platform has essentially a native accessibility API. This is what the native apps use to convey to the operating system the role and the state and the properties of UI components. So maybe if we go back to our form example and we have a button, uh, you know, the role is a button and every operating system has a way of conveying to assistive technology that there's a button in the, in the user interface. Maybe the state of that property, like we were talking about earlier, is disabled. So, you know, in, you can either have that button be an enabled button or a disabled button, but there's a really common vocabulary that, that, the, that assistive technology and the accessibility APIs on the different operating system platforms know how to speak to each other in. So it's robust. Uh, and properties might be something like the name. So click me or submit or go, or please don't name a button go, but uh, it's a role, a state, and a collection of properties, a collection of states, and it's a common language. It's not unfortunately common across operating system platforms, uh, but it is common within a platform. And that's what allows assistive technology vendors to be able to develop technologies that know how to interface with your website and my native app and somebody else's native app because at the end of the day, all of those user interface components with their roles and their states and their properties are being abstracted out to a, a single set of terminology and vocabulary. So when browsers have loaded and parsed the HTML into the DOM, they also take that DOM and they parse it out into the accessibility tree. But we have a problem. Uh, and I have contributed toward it, and I would imagine that anybody in this room who's ever built anything on the client side has contributed toward it, uh, which is we want to create an experience. Uh, we, we don't have the tools in the HTML toolbox. Buttons are easy. Links are easy. Buttons are easy, but sometimes we still choose not to use the button element. Links are easy. When you start to get down into drop-down lists and autocomplete and date pickers, and what we end up having in our markup typically, and then that gets reflected in the DOM, is just a sea of divs and a sea of spans. Div, 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 span, span, span. And there's no meaning at all. None of those divs say to the accessibility API, I'm a date picker. And none of the spans say to the accessibility API, this is an autocomplete field and hey, it, once you start typing in here, a list is going to pop up with some options that you can choose between. In HTML, we didn't really have for the longest time, and, and with many user interface components, we still don't have in HTML the ability to denote what role and the state and the properties of these more complex user interface components. And that's where we run into this problem. We need to find a way to add meaning to all of those meaningless spans and meaningless divs. So what allows us to do that? Uh, as HTML is a little bit complicated and I learned a lot of things being part of the working group and uh, one of them is 400 people can't really make a collective decision very well. Uh, but another one was HTML5 isn't just the spec that we think it is. So HTML5 is a specification. It's all of the markup, the tags and the properties and the attributes. But there's a large collection of documents that makes up the HTML specification that's not just about the markup. And one of those documents that's part of HTML is the, the Y ARIA specification. And that stands for the Web Accessibility Initiative Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And that's a recommendation. And really what it is is a collection of states and properties and roles that don't exist yet. Uh, I say yet, maybe, maybe we'll never get there, but they don't exist yet in HTML, 
uh, but we can tack them on to our divs and our spans to provide additional meaning. And this, this isn't new, this has been around for a while and adoption grows over the course of time, but these are roles and states and properties that we can add to our divs and add to our spans to expand the type of vocabulary that we have to be able to talk about interactive user interface components with, with, with words and, and roles and states that don't exist in HTML itself. And when we do that, when we start to use some of these attributes and roles from Yaria, I mean, I'm not quite sure why you would need to, uh, but maybe you really want your button to be a span element in HTML for, for whatever reason, wherever and however you're using it, maybe the styling you need to apply to it, just it's, it's significantly easier if you're starting from a span than if you're starting with a button. Uh, and that's not great, but that's okay, because if we remember back to what I said earlier, it needs to be easy to start and you don't have to be perfect at this. So if for some reason you need to use a span, then at the very least, you need to be able to make sure that when the browser parses your HTML into the DOM and when that DOM gets translated into the accessibility API, that we're saying to the accessibility API, I know this was a span, but really it's a button. And so from the YARIA specification, you can use role equals button and that overrides the meaninglessness of a span and conveys to assistive technology that it's a button. That's a really simple example because for the very most part you should be using the button element, but when we get into more complex user interface components like tree grids, uh, it becomes really important that we are able to add on that additional information. A more recent uh, evolution that really has no implementation in any browser at the moment except for, I believe, uh, Chrome Canary, is something called the accessibility object model. So we have the document object model, uh, and now emerging as a specification, uh, and also in, in actual implementation through Chrome Canary, is the accessibility object model. And unlike the use of Yaria, where we have to stick all these roles and properties and attributes onto our divs, uh, and they get parsed directly by uh, the browser. But after that, we really don't have much control over what happens. In the accessibility object model, which is just a, an API inside of the browser, you're able to interact with those accessible nodes directly. So you're able to call the accessible node that's part of the DOM element that you want to manipulate, and you're able to change the role and change its states and change its properties directly. Uh, there's a really great article, I think, uh, I retweeted it about mm, two days ago. Uh, it was written by uh, a wonderful woman out of the UK who's a, a great champion for accessibility. And if you go back to my Twitter feed, you'll probably see it a few days back there. And it's a wonderful explanation, along with a demo, of how to start playing around with the accessibility object model in Chrome. There's another thing that happens uh, as we start to push the user interface to the browser, and again, we've been talking, we being the community, has been talking about a lot of that a lot this week, and, and really over the last few Drupal cons, this conversation around headless API first and client side frameworks, and React just got released a couple of days ago under an MIT license, and now maybe you know, some people who were less inclined to use React start to think, hey, maybe that's something I could start to look around at. Uh, the reality is, is we're starting to build applications using patterns that maybe for folks in the Drupal community, uh, we hadn't looked at as much previously. And so maybe we're looking more at single page applications and maybe we're looking more at applications that have transitions between content. There's been some really great work done by, uh, you know, I. I seldom call out uh, organizations for really great work, and uh, certainly Expedia's website, and I don't know if it's the same one here in Europe that we see in Canada, but the Canadian Expedia, Expedia website has done some really great work uh, around making these transitions accessible. So when we go back to talk about affordances, if you think about the experience of, let's say, booking a flight, you put in your, you know, your leaving from Toronto and I'm going to Vienna and I'm 25th of September to the 29th of September and then it takes you to a page with about 50 different flight options. But luckily there's some filters at the top of that page and you can start narrowing down, well I only want direct flights or I only want flights that leave after 6 p.m. 
And when visually, and this kind of gets back to, to some of those affordances we were talking about before, uh, when you start to interact with those filters on most, most sites, especially, especially travel sites I've found, you're not doing a full trip back to the browser. We have this in Views too, right? It, it, with Ajax, we, we don't need to reload the page using Views and Drupal and Ajax. We can just update the search results or update the, the filtered results without needing to reload the page. Uh, and often, uh, when we implement that from a user experience perspective, because there is some delay between when we click the filter and when the results are updated, we use a bit of a visual affordance. Maybe we add an opacity. Maybe we add a spinner of some sort. Maybe we add a little uh, humorous message to the screen. But we do something to, to let the user know, yes, we saw that you've interacted with the application. Uh, the update's not going to be immediate. Don't interact with these results. They're about to change. They're going to change in a second. And we normally, do, well, not normally, we, if we put that in place, it's always visual. Uh, it always uses color or shading, opacity, or a spinner, or a, a message popping up on the screen. Maybe sometimes a, a modal dialog, if, if you want to go that direction, uh, pops up on the screen to let you know, don't interact with this right now. Uh, from a, from the perspective of somebody who's blind and uses a screen reader and doesn't have the visual modality to interact with the screen, though, you never really know what's going on. You kind of get used to a site. I book most of my flights through Expedia, so you go there and you kind of get used to it. You learn the patterns. Uh, but really good user experience. Users shouldn't have to be learning the patterns. And they shouldn't have to be learning the patterns from one website to the next website to the next website to the next. Uh, that's bad user experience. So what Expedia has done, which I think is really great, uh, and I'm going to read this out for you kind of the way it would read to me if I was to do a search for a flight. So I do my search for a flight, and my screen reader says, getting flight information, departure results now sorted by price, lowest. And then let's say I, I you know, because I'm lazy, I do not want to connect. Uh, so I tick the box that says direct flights only. And then my screen reader reads out loud, filtering for stops, results now filtered. So this is doing the, the same thing that we're accomplishing with a visual affordance, but Expedia is achieving the same result, uh, and it's doing it through uh, an audio channel. There's a, another app, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the Headspace app. Uh, I'm actually not sure if their native app does this, but their web experience, if you go into Headspace and log in on the web, they do the same thing. As you're moving through different sections of the app, the assistive technology, the screen reader is reading some of these things out loud to you. When you click on a new tab, when you, when you click on something, it starts to filter, it reads these out loud. And Several years back, we started to do some of the same things in, in Drupal 8. Uh, I remember really specifically uh, the, the system tray or the tool tray, when you dock it to the top or you dock it to the side, it will actually read out loud to assistive technology what's happened, how, how, the, how the user interface has changed. And I think there's even an API that we have in there, uh, which I'm not going to remember the, the name of, but in the JavaScript APIs that are, that are part of Drupal, you can actually push text messages and trust that they're going to get read out loud to screen reader users. You don't have to understand how it works. It's an abstraction. You don't have to go read this YARIA spec and understand all the deviations and differences between browsers. You can just call a function, pass in your string, and trust that it's going to get read out loud. So how does that work? Why is all that happening behind the scenes? If, if you don't just want to trust that it's, going to get, that it's going to happen, or maybe you're building a decoupled application or a single page app, and you don't have access to the, to the API in Drupal that does all this hard work for you, how does it work? It uses YARIA, and it uses something in the spec that's called a live region. And a live region is really simple. It's a node in your DOM. Uh, actually, at a Drupal conference, I try not to say the word node. Uh, because there's a lot of ambiguity. It's an element, we'll say, in the DOM that you've given a specific role. And once you give it that role, assistive technology knows 
to read new information that gets added to it. Typically, the pattern is to stick this node at the, uh, this DOM element at the end of the DOM. You just kind of shove it at the very end as the last item. And then as you want to push these messages to the user, you add new elements into that one and trust that the assistive technology is going to read it out loud. There's some roles and states, and, or sorry, there's some states and properties for this. Uh, there's some states about how, how much of the information does it read? Does it only read new items? Does it read items that get removed? Uh, you know, how polite uh, is it? The word polite is actually used in there. Is it going to interrupt what's being read immediately? Uh, is it going to maybe wait till the end of what's currently being read to announce itself? Uh, and you can read about all those details in the spec, but suffice it to say, you don't have to learn how to do this. You don't have to start working with web audio APIs in order to start, get your web application to start speaking. You can just simply push some text into a part of the DOM that's been marked up with this live region, and assistive technology will take it from there, and it will, the browser plus assistive technology will take it from re there and, and read the information out loud. So that starts to talk about some complex user interaction, things that maybe we haven't done a lot of in the past. And I want to maybe look at a few different interactions that, uh, just as I was thinking about this talk, I was looking at a few different applications I use and, and sites that I go to and jotted down a couple of notes about what I thought worked fairly well and what I thought worked not quite as well. Uh, I gave this presentation about a month ago at Drupal North in Ottawa. And what I'd really love to be able to do is kind of show you what the experience, or I guess show is probably the wrong word, let you hear what the experience is like. Uh, what I found when I tried to do that the last time is that when we're in these conference rooms, uh, there's a lot of reverb. If you're not accustomed to listening to a screen reader, it, even if I slow it down, it's really hard for you to understand what's being said. And then if, it really, that's just generally speaking, even if you were sitting down here beside me. And then once we add the reverb of the conference room, it becomes near impossible for you to understand what's being said. I can barely understand what's being said when it's piped through the speakers. Uh, though what I will do is I'll talk through some of these examples. And I've got about 20 minutes after this session before I need to do something else. So if anybody wants me to kind of show them one-on-one -on -one or in a small group afterward, I'd be happy to kind of unplug my headphones and slow down my screen reader so that you can really get a sense of how these experiences are significantly different from one another. Uh, because we're at DrupalCon Vienna, I thought I'd call this one out because that normally gets people riled up. Uh, the menus, we've got a little bit of a fly-out menu thing happening in the primary navigation. Uh, well, if you can use a pointing device, you have a fly-out menu thing happening. If you're using a screen reader, you have really no way to get to the fly-out menus. So, you know, typical pattern here, you hover over top of the menu item, drops down a list of children, and you can click on one of those children and, and go to that page directly. Uh, I imagine that works quite well on desktop with a pointing device, but on desktop with a screen reader, it doesn't work at all. There's some tricks. Uh, advanced screen reader users know how to do some tricks where we can use some keyboard commands to reroute the mouse and hover it manually, hover it over top of the parent, but that's not a good user experience. First of all, because most screen reader users likely don't know how to do that, and second of all, it, it, leaves, it leaves us guessing all the time at, oh, where do I have to try to virtually hover the mouse now? It, it goes back to affordances. Nothing indicates to us that we should be trying to hover our mouse over top of that, so you know, we would just be guessing all the way through your application that that's what needs to be done. Uh, contrary to that, mass.gov, uh, this is a site that I've been looking at for a, a few years now, and uh, honestly, I think that there's probably some tweaks they could do to the, the exact execution, but strategically, they've really nailed how their menu system works, their, their fly-out menus on that website. Uh, it works well. You can navigate it with the keyboard. It speaks really well to screen reader users. You can navigate across the top-level menu items and then optionally expand down and drill into uh, the, the sub-menu items if you want to. Uh, I think this site is a really good example of, and you know, we've been doing fly-out menus for a very long time in the web community, and I will say that for something that is relatively simple to get right, it is rarely, uh, it's rarely done well from an accessibility perspective. Uh, it's actually, you know, although it's easy to do right once you understand what needs to be done, 
when you just start to think about it and brainstorm about it on your, on your own, it, it really isn't an easy problem to solve. So I don't want to make light of it. If, if you've implemented a flyout menu and it's not accessible, you're not a bad person. You're just, it, they're actually hard to do unless you have a really good pattern to follow. And I think that maybe with a couple of small uh, exceptions, the mass.gov pattern is one of the best that I've seen uh, in order to be a starting place for a pattern to follow. Hotels.com, I book a lot of my hotel rooms through Hotels.com because I like to get the, the 11th night free. Um, when you start to search for a location, this happens a lot on the web, and we've talked about autocomplete before. Uh, you know, if I want to start to search for Vienna, I type in V-I-E-N. Uh, you know, ideally, at some point, there's going to be some notification or indication. Visually, it's simple. You see a list drop down of possible options. Um, so this site's Hotels.com is good, and from an accessibility perspective, they're fairly reasonably accessible. Uh, what I will say, though, is that this autocomplete it never indicates to you that anything's happening. This kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about patterns and, and from an accessibility perspective. I've had to learn how to interact with the Hotels.com site, uh, but I shouldn't have to do that. I, I should be able to interact with it the same as I interact with any autocomplete or, or suggestion dropdown. So what happens on Hotels.com when I type in V-I-E-N is from a, from a textual or audio affordance perspective, absolutely nothing. So there's a visual affordance, and obviously there's a little indicator or the, the drop-down automatically appears, but I have no idea it's there. I've come, I've come to understand when I might be typing in a box that's got a drop-down. So I type in a few letters, wait about a second, and then press the down arrow to see if anything happens. And they really have done a good job at making that part work. So I can press the down arrow, I can navigate through the list, and I can select an option. But going back to those affordances we were talking about earlier, if I didn't know to guess at doing that, I'd never know that that really useful feature existed. Compare that with Expedia, uh, and I've dot, got dot .ca here, but I assume it's probably fairly similar on any of their regional sites. On Expedia, when you start to type in, when I'm looking for a flight and I start to type in VIE, it will actually come up and say, you know, 10 suggestions. So that's, an, that, that's a little bit of an audio or a textual affordance. It, it tells me, hey, Everett, you've started typing VIEN. There are 10 suggestions available for you. And then I'm like, oh, great. Now I know to press the down arrow. Or if I type in VIE and it says 18 suggestions, I'm like, I don't want to look through a list of 18. So then I hit the letter N and it's like, oh, now there's only 10 suggestions. If I hit the letter N again, maybe there's only two suggestions. Uh, and it announces that out loud using that live region concept. Uh, and that really, from a user experience perspective, is a drastically improved user experience. Aeroplan, this is probably something that's only familiar to, I would imagine, Canadians. I'm not sure if Aeroplan exists outside of Canada. It's a loyalty program really tightly associated with Air Canada. Um, when I try to search for a hotel, when I want to spend my points uh, on a hotel, when I go to Aeroplan's website, the date picker field is a disabled text box. It, I can see the date in it, but when I interact with that text box, I can't actually type anything. The field's disabled. Uh, and there's really nowhere on the screen, like, I have searched and searched and searched. Only the other day when I was preparing this presentation did I, I'm like, that's it. I'm going to interact with the text box. I'm going to move my little virtual mouse around the screen and click, in, uh, click on the text box. And then I'm going to read from the very top of the screen to the very bottom of the screen to see where in the DOM somebody thought they might inject the calendar pop-up, which I, I have to imagine that when I click on this thing, there's, there's no other pattern out there. When I click on this thing, it has to pop up a calendar. So I just started reading from the top. And in this weird location, nowhere near the date text box, but also not in that common very bottom of the, of the DOM, that is some weird location nearish to the top of the page, I found a calendar. It was a grid. It didn't use a table, so it was hard to interact with, but I did finally find it. So again, this is an example of having to really teach yourself for every single application you interact with. Oh, look, I need to type in another date. How am I going to do that this time? Is it going to be easy? Is it going to be hard? Is it going to be very hard, is it going to be impossible? And I contrast that with Hilton, Hilton's uh, date picker, which is really easy to use. Uh, Hilton's date picker, uh, 
probably one of the best, and I think, I, haven't, I didn't dig into it uh, because this isn't really a coding conversation, uh, but I suspect they're using a library because I've seen the same pattern elsewhere. When you, with a screen reader or a keyboard, start to interact with that, you can navigate with arrow keys, it announces everything out loud, you can move between days, weeks, months, it's a, it's a really lovely experience and, you know, compared to the Aeroplan experience where for like a year I couldn't find the calendar in the first place and once I found it, it was hard to use, this is a, a delight to interact with. Uh, I've put at the very bottom of the list here volunteers. We won't do that now, but if, because public shaming isn't very nice, uh, but if you'd like private shaming or small group shaming afterward, uh, feel free to, to come up to me again. I've got about 15 or 20 minutes after the presentation, and I'd be happy to you know, shame you privately for, for, the, for the poor accessibility of your application. Uh, also, if, if your application is really accessible, I'll, I'll tweet about it. Oh, good work. I'll give you a little gold star. So there's something in it for you. Uh, the real big takeaway that I want to, I, I want everybody to leave here with is JavaScript is not to blame. JavaScript is a language. It, it's a language. It lets us it's got syntax, it lets us control the DOM, control experiences in the browser. But as, as you've heard, whether it's Expedia or Hilton uh, or, or the others that I've referenced here, you can build really accessible uh, and really great user experiences in the browser using JavaScript. JavaScript is not a problem. If we look back to the beginning, way back in 1998, absolutely it was a problem. Guaranteed it was a problem. Uh, and I don't want angry tweets. I understand that client-side applications have their downsides. We live in a world of trade-offs, uh, whether it's uh, slow internet connection, whether it's uh, people with really old technologies. Uh, there's lots of reasons why you might not want to build an application that requires JavaScript. Uh, but that's not the purpose of this conversation. This conversation is to say that if you've already done the trade-off analysis and decided that yes, you are going to build an application that requires JavaScript, that the fact that you're using JavaScript is not <laughs> impeding you from being able to build a truly accessible and great user experience. You're gonna to have to put work in. It doesn't come for free. It's not a zero effort uh, endeavor. But the fact that you're using JavaScript on its own or requiring the use of JavaScript isn't uh, a barrier. It shouldn't be seen as an obstacle. So what do you do next? Um, there's lots of component libraries uh, and toolkits and frameworks where there's people working, you know, Drupal's not the only open source project I've heard, and there's people working on accessibility. We've got people working on accessibility in Drupal. Uh, we've got people working on accessibility in Angular. We've got people working on accessibility in Bootstrap. People working on accessibility in React. There's, there's communities built up around these frameworks and there's, there's groups within those communities that are trying to make them more accessible. And they're not perfect. We are not perfect in the Drupal community with our accessibility. Um, and none of these other communities, I imagine, are, they're not perfect either. But we don't need to aim for perfect. We need to aim for doing better than we're doing right now. Uh, always looking ahead, and, and whether we're looking ahead from a layout initiative in core, or we're looking ahead from an API first initiative, or we're looking ahead from an accessibility initiative, Really what we're trying to do is set a, set a goal for ourselves and, and always do, be doing better than we are now. Um, that's, really all, that's really all I wanted to share with you today. I think we have a little bit of time uh, for questions. Before we go into questions, number, the, I want to cover a couple of key things. Sprints, there are sprints tomorrow. Uh, there's a slide here. You've probably seen this slide during every single session. So. Uh, Look at the sprints if you're going to be here. You probably already know if you're going to a sprint. I don't know if there's an accessibility sprint. Uh, that I'm not here tomorrow. I have to leave at 6.30 in the morning. Um, but if there is an accessibility sprint, go and learn. Uh, learn together. Uh, really going back to the keynote this morning, you know, step one, if you know nothing or you feel like you have nothing to contribute, great. Just go and sit beside somebody else and learn from them. And then next time you'll be able to do a little bit and then you'll find out that a few times later, you're able to teach the person who sits down at the table and they don't know anything or they feel like they don't know anything or where to start. Uh, feedback, we've got this feedback information up here. I'd appreciate if you give feedback on the session and I'm sure the organizers would appreciate if you give feedback about the, about the conference in general. 
Um, so I'll take the time now. If there's any questions, uh, I'll open it up to questions. Uh, thanks for that presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask, do you think that uh, something like Chrome Vox gives relevant, uh, relevant results for a developer, or should one just uh, use some other program or skip that phase and go to directly to real users? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think that any tool gives you relevant feedback. Uh, there's lots of tools out there. I think that the, the question is, are you going to use just one tool? Uh, are you going to do more of a 360 review? So I really want to drive home the point that anything that you're doing more than nothing is better than nothing. I really think, uh, I, I, I published an article earlier in August on, on our company website, and I think in that article I suggest find a couple of people that maybe interact with with your application in a, in a different way than, than the norm. Maybe they're a screen reader user, uh, maybe they don't use a pointing device. Take them out for a coffee or take them out for lunch and just ask them to tell you what it's like for them to use the web. Step one, I really think, is building empathy. Uh, and then maybe pay them 50 or or $100 and sit down with them and ask them to show you how they use your application. The, the best way for you to learn where the barriers are in your application is going to be to have somebody who faces accessibility challenges on a daily basis point them out to you. But if you can't do that for some reason, if that's not really going to work, use some of the automated tools and they're gonna find for you some of the low-hanging fruit. Hello, I would like to know what is a 360 review and what, is the, what are the criteria for a 360 review? Sure. Well, I just made that term up 16 seconds ago, but I'll, I'll try to give you uh, my thoughts. I think starting with automated tools, uh, having an expert review, so having somebody who is an expert in web application accessibility come in and give their perspective, uh, and then real users of your application who have disabilities and use assistive technology. So look at it from the, from the technical tool standpoint, look at it from the expert analysis standpoint, look at it from the user experience standpoint. And really, it's not that different from any design review. You know, we look at, we do heuristic analysis of design. Uh, we take, do we take best practices and apply them? We build design hypotheses using our experience, and we apply it. But at the end of the day, until you get your design and, and your interaction patterns in front of real users of your application and ask them to complete tasks and observe how easy or difficult that is for them, you're, not, you're only working on hypotheses. Any other questions? Great, well thank you very much for joining today and if you do want to be privately or small group shamed or if you have questions for me, feel free to come up after. <laughs>